Anything you do, move, touch, whatever, if you lift it in the real world, it's probably going to be connected to you through your hands. You need to have strong hands. And if you've ever moved out of your apartment or your I'm house, just say that. you know okay. exactly what I'm talking about. An hour later, it's yeah. typically your hands that are giving Everything's up. Everything's like riding on one finger that's like holding yeah. everything left. So don't, yeah. be, don't, be, don't be that guy who has to set his dresser down every 10 yeah. steps. No. <laughs> yeah, I- hey, do you want to be featured on Mind Pump? You want to be guest on our show? Go to mindpumpmedia.com forward slash MFP dash testimonial leave us your testimonial if we like your story if it touches our hearts and blows our minds you may win a a chance to get a trip to come here to mind pump studios and be on our podcast now in this episode we talk about the deadlift one of the most effective exercises anybody can do for their posterior chain that refers to all the muscles on the back side of your body that includes the very popular Butt muscles, you want to develop amazing glutes, you should probably deadlift. Hamstrings, yes, you should probably deadlift. What about a nice back? You got it, deadlift. Uh, What about functional strength? Developing a bulletproof back so you don't hurt yourself. All deadlift. So in this episode, we talk about the deadlift, why everybody should do it. Now, this episode is brought to you by our sponsor, Paleo Valley. Paleo Valley makes some pretty damn good supplements, all of them natural, all of them organic, Now, my favorite product from Paleo Valley are their meat sticks. They're grass-fed meat sticks. They're not dry. They taste amazing. Even my kids like them. The macros are great, so it's uh, no carbs. It's got some healthy fats and some proteins, and they're very, very delicious. Uh, They also have uh, pumpkin spice paleo bars. These are paleo-approved bars that you can eat at home that taste pretty damn good. Um, Because you listen to Mind Pump, you get a discount. Here's what you do. Go to paleovalley.com. That's P-A-L-E-O-V-A-L-L-E-Y.com forward slash mind pump. Use the code mindpump15 for 15% off. One last thing. We're still running our holiday at home bundle sale, which includes three maps workout programs that require minimal equipment. So you can do all of them at home. This bundle includes maps anywhere, map suspension, and our very high-intensity, short, fat-burning workout program, MAPS HIT. Get all three of them for $99.99. Just go to MAPSNovember.com. Again, that's MAPSNovember.com. Why should you deadlift? Oh, you know, it's to me, it's it's funny how there's controversy. Sal's favorite lift. Yeah, it is. It's funny to me how there's controversy around some exercises that, in my opinion, just to my experience... And I'm sure you guys will agree that are, you know, like the deadlift, for example, it's got to be, it is one of the best all around exercises that people should do from people who just want to improve their health, longevity, to people who want to build a lot of muscle, to wanting to burn body fat. To me, it's, it's crazy why there's so much sometimes controversy around this exercise. Well, I think some of that has to do with the the fear of hurting the low back. Like when you look at an exercise and if you if if you don't know what what uh, you know, if you don't know what it is, right? And you're looking at a deadlift. I remember in my, you know, early teens of lifting and even in my early 20s, uh seeing people deadlift, although it was rare, but when you did see it, I thought, "Oh my god, that guy's going to hurt his back." Like he doesn't know mm-hmm. what he's doing. So if you're if you're unaware of the exercise and you if you've never performed the movement or had someone teach you or tell you about the movement, at first glance, it looks like that looks like a terrible exercise. It yeah. looks like oh. you're just going to hurt your low yeah, back. Yeah, especially if you see somebody performing it with bad form and you're kind of aware of body mechanics and you can see how that could be problematic, but uh, you know, not considering the benefits of that is a tragedy. Hey, you know what? Speaking of which, there was a meme the other day that was hilarious and it said uh, like tr- like fitness hack, perform any exercise wrong to make it a low back exercise. <laughs> <laughs> That's perfect. Yeah. Yes, it is. No, I think you, I think you guys are right because uh, for so long we've been hammered that we need to lift things a particular way off the ground, right? You got to squat real low and don't bend over to pick things. In other words, don't hip hinge because that m- could hurt your back. And that's totally false. If uh, with proper form, a deadlift, just like any exercise, by the way, if you can perform the exercise with good strength, mobility, and technique, that exercise is safe. Uh, now, there's definitely uh, higher risks with some exercises, but mainly because there's more skill 
involved with some exercises. For example, the risk of doing a uh, dumbbell curl is far lower than doing a squat or a deadlift and especially lower than doing, let's say, an Olympic lift like a snatch, mm -hmm. mainly because those are very high skill or high skill in comparison exercises. But done properly, deadlifts are um, incredibly safe. So yes, that's part of the reasons why. And you know what? It is better these days than it used to be. I mean, when I was a trainer in the late 90s, when I first became a trainer and up until the early 2000s, now I had the, uh, the luxury of learning how to work out from some power lifters early on. I was maybe 16 years old, I think, and they were the ones that taught me about barbell squats. They taught me about the deadlift, and it completely blew my mind because as a kid trying to build muscle, it was so hard to gain even a half a pound of muscle. I did those two exercises, and over a summer, I think I gained 15 pounds, and it was just, it, it blew me away of how much muscle I could gain from just these two exercises. So here I was as a trainer, 18, 19, 20 years old, in the late 90s in these gyms that had, I mean, we're talking about 30,000 square foot gyms, so big gyms, big box gyms, mm -hmm. lots of equipment, lots of cardio, lots of machines, one squat rack, and nobody deadlift. In fact, yeah. uh, when I was as a trainer with deadlift, I would get stopped by members predictably would come up to me and tell me, hey, kid, you're going to hurt your back. You shouldn't be doing that. Or you, yeah. call, you call yourself a trainer. That's not a, bad, that's not a good right. you know, exercise. Dude, even in the athletic world, uh, I think that it just was it was shunned, for, which was hilarious to me because we were doing power cleans that we would pick the weight off the ground, which in a Fast. sense is, yeah, but even before that, like going through the technique of it, you have to pick it up with good tension and, and be controlled and stable. And it's everything that you, you want to apply in a, in a normal deadlift. It's just that adding a bit more weight and just focusing on that part of the lift mm -hmm. for some reason, uh, you know, we weren't focusing on that, but if we would have, it would have definitely contributed to a better lift well, for our Olympic ben, lifts. Lifting things off the ground is a fundamental human movement. Uh, till this day, it's probably one of the only times you lift something. If you think we have a very sedentary life nowadays, right? We live in modern societies. We sit at desks all day and chairs all day or in our cars all day. <clears throat> But the, think about the one time you actually are working with resistance in the real world. You're, um, you're probably rarely picking things up and pressing them up overhead. Sometimes, maybe. You rarely squat with a full squat these days, although that's a fundamental human move. It's just we don't do it a lot, right? But you probably still bend over to pick up a box. Maybe your Amazon package came in or your DoorDash food came in. Or, or your PRX stuff, which is a bit heavy. Yeah. <laughs> or you're going to pick up your kid or your dog or a bag of dog food. We, it's a fundamental human movement that is still very important and relevant uh, today with the movements that we're, you know, we're still doing today. So it's something that you should make uh, stronger. I think the, the, the main reason is it's, it's the most difficult exercise for somebody to learn that is part of the, you know, core, you know, five lifts that we talk about all the time. Mm. I think it's more difficult than a squat. Uh, a squat is something uh, relatively close to what everybody does. If you sit down in a chair, uh, you you have done some form of a squat, mm. whether it was pretty There's or not. There's definitely more fear in getting people to deadlift. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah. True. I mean, the 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 whole idea of being able to keep your your back rigid, your arms stiff, and then to hinge at the hips and keep everything in this fixed position while you just hinge. The, there's just there's not a lot of things that you do every single day where you do that properly. Like even the things that you're talking about, right? Like bending over to grab your Amazon package. The truth is nobody is hinging at the hips to do that. True. They're rounding at the back and they're doing that. And because it's so lightweight, most people don't get injured. And the few people that do, it's because they, you know, went just a little bit out of range of motion and end up hurting themselves. So when, when I look at the deadlift and I think about like the, the people that I trained, uh, and why they didn't do it before I trained them, <clears throat> most of them just a fear, the fear of, of, of doing it incorrectly and hurting their back. Uh, and it is, it is technical. It's a little more difficult uh, to teach, I think, than even a squat. Like I said, I can, I can get somebody to squat relatively good like right away in the first session. Sometimes deadlifting can take uh, repeat sessions with me of of coaching before yeah. I can really get them to get the movement. And you know what's funny is I, I'd say the last ten years of my personal training career, I did train a lot of people uh, over the age of sixty. I had uh, I'd say at least forty percent or fifty percent of my clients, which is a big percentage. Uh, most trainers don't have that many clients over that age group, but I did. 
Um, I worked, uh, my studio was next to a hospital. I had lots of referrals from doctors and I had all of them deadlift every 70 year olds, 80 year old. I mean, of course it was all appropriate. So sometimes the deadlift consisted of uh, a resistance band. Sometimes it was just a bar. Um, but I had some of them, you know, at 70 deadlifting the 45 pound plates, mm -hmm. you know, or I would get the big quarter plates that were the same diameter so they could have it off the same distance off the floor. Um, never once did I have a back injury with any of my clients. Doug, who was my client, in fact, Doug hired me because he had back problems. And within six months, he was able to deadlift uh, close to 400 pounds with no back pain whatsoever. Yeah. So it's this this whole, uh, it's a myth, this whole thing about you yeah. deadlift wrong, yes, you'll hurt yourself. Just like if you do anything wrong right. with weight. Right. And I've seen people like sort of steer people more towards a, a, a trap bar or something that's maybe a little easier to teach, but also... Uh, you know, there's, there's problems, you know, that could occur even with that, uh, in front where it, I know Mark, Mark Ripto like kind of talks about this, where like there's a potential for it to swing. Um, and you know, but it, it, as far as just like stepping into it in the grips, you know, it's a little bit easier to coach. So I could see like starting there as, as sort of a starting point, but really what we're trying to do is address the posterior chain, which is very hard to do unless you're doing something like a deadlift. Well, you know, and I don't know how much I agree or disagree with Mark with his his assessment of that I think the the trap bar deadlift is too much like a squat mm -hmm. to call it a deadlift mm -hmm. to me it's I, I think it, 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 it emulates a squat especially more. for someone that doesn't know how to hip hinge well right they end up turning it into a, very, a squat yeah. it'd be like yeah like 60 70 percent more squat yeah than deadlift. so uh, you know I'm not the biggest fan of I mean it, it's a it's a great regression for like somebody in advanced age that has mm -hmm. that's really really stiff and tight and, and not good mobility at all but if you if you have relatively good mobility and and I can get you down in that position I'd prefer to teach you on a barbell there's another uh, you know, community or group of people that avoid it. And uh, this one is probably the most annoying for me because it's not a, a, a from fear of them getting hurt, but of fear of building a bulky waist. Mm. Uh, so, and that's the bodybuilding community. Oh, the, the whole, the mm. fitness <clears throat> figure competitor, the, the, you know, yeah, when I, when I was, when I was deadlifting the most was actually when I was competing. Uh, it just happened to overlap with, uh, you know, me meeting Sal and, uh, Sal was really good at deadlifting and I'm competitive by nature and it was fun to try and see if I could catch up to the amount of weight he was doing and up until that point in my life I had never programmed like can I get really strong in deadlifts and you know I tried to do that and so I was in the middle of competing and deadlifting more weight than I'd ever deadlifted and more frequently than I ever had in my entire career and never was that a problem for my waist on stage. In fact, that was one of my strengths was my shoulder to waist ratio. But yet, uh, it's still very, very popular in the bodybuilding space. I would see all my peers and, and many of them uh, didn't, most of them didn't deadlift. It would, in fact, it was really rare that I would meet another uh, men's physique athlete that was also deadlifting, which is a shame. Yeah, the mm -hmm. irony is some of the best uh, competitive bodybuilders at all time of all time were great deadlifters had had were deadlifts were a staple in the routine or it was a staple early in the routine okay so Dorian Yates he deadlifted a lot early in his career later on uh, didn't deadlift so much Ronnie Coleman obviously that famous video on YouTube of him you know pulling 800 pounds off Colombo. the floor was a power lifter mm -hmm. Franco Colombo Arnold Schwarzenegger uh, deadlifts develop um, incredible muscle they're very effective and the whole waist building thing. Look, here's the deal. At, at the most, if you just if you just have this weird, amazing muscle building genetics of, yeah. of your waist, you, you're going to maybe add a less than a quarter of an inch around your waist of muscle, um, which is pales in comparison to the to the inches of fat that you may carry. Yeah, but if you get lean enough, I correct, mean, it's defined. It looks great. Well, it, not, it doesn't happen. And not only that, it, it tends to like because this was like what we talked about with the whole CrossFit thing. Someone asked us a question not that long ago on our show about. You know why does it seem like so many CrossFit girls have boxy waist? And it's mm. not the 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 exercises that have caused that. It's, it's that self selection bias. Yeah, when you have a, a if you have a wider waist, it's going to be easier to lift heavier weight on there. It's yeah. more advantageous to. Well, have you know what the irony is: uh, a a deadlifter body doesn't necessarily have to have a wide waist. You look at someone like Larry Wheels, who's got actually a, quite a small waist compared to yeah, or myself shoulder, or you. It's long arms. Yeah. Long arms is really the the biomechanical advantage. Totally. To be, so you like good deadlifters tend to have long arms and tend to be kind of tall. Um, but aside from that, no, you're 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 not. Don't worry about building your waist. It's stupid. And here's the thing with bodybuilders: stop looking at pro bodybuilders for what you need to do. They're very different from you, and they tend to shy away from 
more complex, challenging exercises in favor of easier ones to develop their muscles. And it makes sense. I get it. Uh, why they, why they may do something like that. Uh, that's why bodybuilders don't do a lot of them do barbell squats either. And the average person would be dumb to not do a barbell squat. Um, here's the other category of people that it's better now, but it used to really annoy me that cause this group of people should know better. And that's trainers. I see trainers who are afraid to teach mm -hmm. clients yeah. how to deadlift. And part of it may be because they believe in the, the myth of deadlifting that it's you know too mm -hmm. risky, but I think a big part of it is they're lazy. Yeah, they're not they're not confident enough to teach it a lot of times too. Yes, I've that, okay. So if I'm being honest, that's what it was for me. I didn't train it very often as a as a young trainer, which made me feel insecure about teaching it. Yeah, uh, and I'm still this way today. You you're not going to catch me teaching a client how to snatch. Because I don't think that I'm proficient enough in it. Mm -hmm. So if I don't believe I'm proficient enough in a movement, I don't believe in teaching that movement. I think that you should at least have acquired that skill yourself. And so sure. uh, when you look at your your you know your uh, 24 hour fitness, your UFC gyms, your crunches, your you know your your typical big box gym trainer, I would venture to say that what sixty percent maybe, and that's I would say on a good side of sixty. Back when we were trainers, mm -hmm. eighty to ninety percent did not deadlift. Mm -hmm. I mean, on my, all of my training staffs, maybe I had one or two trainers that yeah, deadlifted. Nobody maybe, did. Yeah, maybe I had that. So if you figure you got you know a a, a great a, a huge percentage of trainers in these big box gyms that are seeing a majority of our general population, they're not deadlifting themselves. They're not going to feel secure enough to teach it to the the general pop, and that's why we're seeing this. Yeah, in yeah. fact, in those days, you still see this a lot in gyms these days. But a lot of the uh, the plates are these hexagonal plates, which you can't deadlift with. Yeah, terrible. Yeah, you place Especially them down. If it's touch and go, exactly, they shift, and then you got to fix the bar and all that stuff. And although a lot of gyms now are starting to change back to the round ones, which are what you would appropriately want to deadlift with. Here's the funny thing: these days, I see women deadlifting more than I do men in mm. terms of not in terms of total weight, but in terms of just numbers. Well, word got out that it does great things uh, for your posterior. That's right. The deadlift develops essentially. Think of it this way: it'll work your backside from your neck all the way down to essentially your knees, even your calves a little bit, really, but down to your knees. So, with good deadlifting, you'll develop hamstrings, really good hamstrings, really good glutes. Amazing erector spinae muscles. These are the muscles in the middle of your back that go all the way up. You'll get great lat activation, rhomboid and trapezius activation. In fact, all those muscles I just listed, the deadlift just happens to be either the best exercise for all those muscles or top three best exercise for all those muscles. I can't think of another exercise that can do that, really. I mean, we just said hamstrings, glutes all those back muscles, and I'm not even counting things like your grip and forearm strength. Mm -hmm. uh, the deadlift is the best exercise or at least top three for all and of And there's camps yeah. right now that will make an argument of specific exercises that target those areas and, and therefore think, they think is better. For example, doing a lying leg curl – uh, you know, is going to target the hamstrings more directly, right? Arguably than a deadlift, but it will not build uh, your hamstrings more than than not a deadlift. even close. Yeah, not even close. And a lot of that has to do with the load. Mm -hmm. You just cannot you cannot load the lying leg curl the same way you can load a heavy deadlift. Well, I remember you telling the story of when you you used the hamstring curl all the time. And uh, you stopped so that you could just deadlift, and then you went back to the hamstring curl, and you were strongest I've ever been in my life. Yeah, I mean, literally over ten years of consistent lying leg curls, consistently for ten years, mm -hmm. uh, and then taking a break for almost a year, and only deadlifting because that was again back when I was trying to chase your numbers, and so I was deadlifting, you know, uh, on a low week, two week, uh, two times a week, on a high week, four times a week. And of course, varying my load and everything and in, in, uh, intensity, but I was—that's how frequent I was deadlifting. Because and I was like, so I don't need to be doing any hamstring curls. Uh, and it wasn't until I had got my deadlift uh, well over 500 pounds that I thought, oh, I'll, let me see what I can leg curl. I hadn't done any of these exercises and really got on the machine thinking that, okay, I haven't done it in a year. I can't expect to be as strong as I was, yeah. you know, last year when I was doing this at my peak. And lo and behold, you know, I was like double the weight. And it was just, it blew my mind. Yeah, the body responds to the environment that you present it in. And, and the thing is, 
Like it, it's it's such a louder signal and it's such a louder uh, uh, you know response that that the body has to account for, and so it's gonna it's gonna try and adapt to this environment that you're placing it in. So thinking even of that versus like a single joint exercise versus a multi joint exercise, you know this this overall demand is just gonna create a bigger response and a louder response. Oh, and so for, just for me, like again, I you know I, when I first introduced these into my workouts, I remember. Just being blown away that how this one exercise uh, could get my body to respond more than all these other exercises I had done before. And then when I would train clients, clients, of course, there would be a little bit of pushback, especially my older clients. Oh, I don't know if I should be doing that. But they trusted me. And luckily, I'm, I'm convincing. And I convinced them to do it. And within a month or two, they'd come back to me and be like, uh, I feel uh, I'm standing taller. I've never felt so strong. Sal, you know that back pain that used to bother me a little bit? I don't have it anymore. It doesn't bother me. Or I'd get my female clients where they'd come to me and be like, my husband's commenting on my backside or I don't can't believe how good I look. I had one woman who was getting married and she was going to wear a dress where the, the back was exposed and she was afraid of deadlifting because of the, the, all the stuff we talked about earlier. I said, don't worry about it. Anyway, she took a picture when she tried the dress on and then there was a picture from her actual wedding and there was a period of you know months in between them. And the before and after, and there was incredible. Her mid, her low back, the, the low back where you see the curvature and where you get that nice space in between looks really attractive on women. That was the part that she was most blown away with. And this is over the course of months. Like I think it was like three months. It wasn't years or anything like that. So just an incredibly effective exercise. And then the crossover into the real world is just amazing. You get strong hands. You get a strong spine. You know, when you take your, if you were to take your spine out of your body, it's made up of all these joints. A spine, you try to stand it up on the table or on the, on the floor, and it flops over in whatever direction, okay? What supports it and keeps it rigid and prevents it from getting injured are all the muscles that surround it, all the muscles that are around it. And a big part of that are all the muscles of the back. And doing deadlifts will make, if you do them right and you get strong, let me put it this way. If you have good form, good technique, and you're pretty strong at a deadlift, you, your, your back is close to bulletproof. You're not going to hurt your back, you know, lifting something uh, off the floor at home. You're not going to hurt your back by picking up a box or playing with your kids. Your back becomes close to bulletproof. Here's mm -hmm. the other thing, uh, you know, um, uh, besides what, what most people think, uh, this is really best for beginners. Oh, so, it's a great exercise for beginners. You know, for beginners, when I think of like how I used to train clients, right? So I avoided exercise like this because they were difficult. Later in my career... Things like the squat and the deadlift began to become the center point of all of my programming. Yeah. Like, if I got a beginner client and it doesn't matter what their goal was to, you know, lose body fat, build muscle, longevity, overall health, whatever, but they are a new client and, and they couldn't deadlift or squat very well, uh, that was like everything. It was mm -hmm. all about getting a good deadlift because I knew once I did that, it laid such a solid foundation for everything else that we're going to do not to mention all the benefits that come from doing this exercise so it's not just getting good at the deadlift lays this great foundation but the amount of calories it burns the amount of muscle that it builds mm -hmm. and and when you were talking about the deadlift that's working the posterior chain when you looked at uh common deviations on clients we're so anterior driven meaning all the we work all the muscles in front of us we're so we're rounded forward and we're closing in right from sitting at desk and doing things in front of us and the deadlift literally opposes all of that. It's mm -hmm. one of the best exercises to bring you back into good posture. Yes. For all those things you mentioned, like we're always doing things in front of us and we're just not addressing uh, our muscles uh, behind us because mm -hmm. it's just not a consideration that, uh, you know, we have very often to to really single that out. And uh, like you, I, I started to rearrange uh, the way I would deal with beginners because I looked at it. I mean, this is the base. This is the base of the tree. This is a trunk of the tree. I have to start here. Uh, in order to establish a good fundamental strength to then tear off from that and then introduce all these other uh, variables to them. Now, when you're a beginner and you're deadlifting, just like with any other exercise, the goal is not to see how strong you can get. The goal is not to push yourself to your limit. The goal is to perfect the technique and the form. So treat the deadlift as a practice, right? So if you've never done it before or if you haven't done it in a while, when you go to the gym and it's time to deadlift, Think of every set like uh, practice, like you're practicing your free throw or you're practicing your golf swing. You're not trying to do it as hard as you can. 
You're just doing it over and over again with excellent technique, excellent form. Um, here's another thing to under, for beginners that I, I often need to communicate. You want shoes that are very flat, okay? Any kind of a heel mm -hmm. in your shoe, like a running shoe. Running shoes tend to have a little bit of a heel. Most sneakers have a little bit of a heel. You don't want that because that throws your center of gravity forward a little bit. You want very flat shoes, so chucks are really good from Converse. Or barefoot. Or, or yeah, barefoot. Minimus uh, kind of shoes. If you're working at home, you could go barefoot. You want to have really, really flat feet, and when you bend down and bend over to grab the bar, first off, make sure you can go all the way down to the bar with good form. If you can't, this is when it's okay to put it on a rack and practice from higher uh, heights. And this is what I would do with a lot of my clients. I would have them go down as low as they could with really good technique. And if that wasn't enough to get a bar that was the, the, the whatever what they call the regulatory height off the ground, which is the, the size of your 45-pound plates. That's how far all deadlifts start, right? If they can't go down like that without bad form, they're too tight or whatever, mm -hmm. then I would put it up on a rack. So we would start with the bar just above their knees or just below their knees. As they got better at that, then we would slowly lower the bar. Once we got down to the proper height, then I would go practice with the bar, then add a little bit of weight at a time. The idea is to get really good with the technique. You also want to hinge at the hips, bend the knees, and when you come up, you don't want your hips... You don't want your knees to straighten before you come up with your hips. Okay, right. this is an issue that sometimes beginners make where they'll come up with the deadlift and what will happen is they'll straighten their knees and now the rest of the deadlift looks like right. straight legs, like a straight leg deadlift, which is not what we're trying to do here. They're both simultaneous, knees and hips at the same time. And then you stand up real tall with yeah, your shoulders. Because otherwise, back. you end up with this folded over upper body position that now I'm trying to hinge just my upper body up to make up for that last bit. It all has to happen. Yes. At once. Brace your core while you're doing this and don't exaggerate. Here's another mistake a lot of beginners make they exaggerate the arch in their low back. They yeah. think that because they're bending over and hinging, right. that they need to arch super strong. That will, that will make you not feel too good in your low back. You want to have your normal, neutral spine posture. Brace it, keep it that way the entire time. And we've done some really good videos. I, I did a you know a good sumo deadlifting video. Uh, I know collectively we've all done a deadlift video on there. We did some great content with uh, Jordan Syatt on there that was for deadlifting. We mm -hmm. Tons of it. I think we have several videos with Jordan Shallow uh, as far as deadlifting. So, of course, all of our programs have deadlifts built into it. But then if you're looking to uh, perfect the movement or learn the movement – and get good at the technique of it, um, absolutely use the the Mind Pump TV as a resource. Yeah. Now, here's the fun part, right? Once you get to the point where your technique is really good and you're slowly adding weight and you can start to challenge yourself, the strength gains that come from the deadlift are fast and furious. They are really, really fun. It's enjoyable. Pace yourself because sometimes you could push it a little bit too fast. But this is when you have a lot of fun. The deadlift is one of those exercises that, that is really, really good in the relatively low rep range. It's one of those exercises where anywhere between five to eight reps is great uh, for most people. And you can have a lot of fun adding weight little by little. I know with my beginning clients, once we got past the point of technique and mobility and everything's looking good, I mean, it was not uncommon to add five to 10 pounds every single week, which mm -hmm. is exciting. I don't know too many other exercises where you see those kind of strength gains come on that do you, quick. Do you guys think that you know some of the the benefits that you get from deadlifting, similar to squat, squat or is this way too? And I, I'm trying to think of another exercise where this comes to mind, but they both have an, an isometric component in it the entire time. Mm. Like when you think about that exercise, that exercise, like mm -hmm. in order for you to deadlift, especially if you start lifting, you know, 100, 200, 300 plus pounds. Uh, the importance of being able to keep a rigid, stable spine. It just for, it forces an isometric contraction on all of those back muscles, your core muscles, to hold that position. And then on top of that, you're also hip hinging, right? So the the combination of that, you know, posterior chain and the, ha the hamstrings, the glutes having to fire, but then also the isometric contraction that you're getting all up and down your spine. I would think that has to be one of the major reasons why it's so beneficial and so many people neglect isometric exercise it is, in the first it, place. Yeah. It is. And if you can I mean if you can lift good weight and maintain stable spine, mm -hmm. you create a, a a pattern, a movement pattern in your body where, you know, you you're 
safe. You keep your back safe from injury in the everyday world. I mean, that's the recipe to to promote strength is to uh, create a, a situation where you can stabilize a substantial amount of load, and now you can generate more force uh, to accommodate for that. So it's really the body just needs to know that all the joints are are safe and stable and accounted for uh, in order to you know provide you with more of this force output. So the, the body just doesn't want to do that to, to, to injure you. So you're creating this environment now that that shows that you know there's a way to channel this and, and harness that that uh, force that you have already. Do you guys notice how? And uh, I, I think I really noticed this you know more recent than I did earlier on because of the the, the emphasis on how much deadlifting I did later on in my career. Uh, this just happened to me just the other day. I was uh, we were coming back from somewhere. I don't remember where Katrina and I just went not that long ago. It was a couple weeks ago. And uh, God, she she loaded her suitcase up with. I mean, the fucking thing had to have been a hundred and something pounds. Like it was so, what? Yeah, I that mean, much. Yeah, she must. She wow. must You'd be paying she, a big bill. To she, your yeah, life. she must. No, we weren't flying. We we're driving. Or else there's no the guarantee. It was well over the the fifty two pound <laughs> she, she limit. She packed her dumbbells. Yeah, that, yeah no, that, that reminds think, me of Spaceballs. Remember when she picks up that like huge hair dryer? Yeah, yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. So it felt like that, right? So, but m- reason why I'm I'm sharing this is because I I, I catch myself. Uh, doing this naturally because I've trained the deadlift so often is all I'm, I'm, we have four flights of stairs right in my house. And so I, I go to get up the stairs and right away, of course, I'm like anybody else. I, I default to my bad pattern. I just kind of step on the step and right away I can feel like I'm not in a good position and I naturally just kind of hinge the hips back and then load, load the glutes. Yep. And it's just because I've practiced that hip hinge so much in, in the deadlift it's almost subconsciously mm-hmm. as soon as my body feels whoa this is a lot this is more weight than a, mm-hmm. you know if i'm carrying a uh, something light up and downstairs it, you, you you don't even think about it but at the moment i have to like okay focus a little bit on stabilizing and being in control and i could hurt myself my body naturally then kicked back into the and loaded my hips and it's from all that practice of hinging at the hips with the deadlift and i can feel myself walking up the stairs I don't feel it in my low back. I feel it in my butt. Yeah. Mm-hmm. My butt feels it as I'm walking up versus how most people would just kind of be holding onto the bags with their back all rounded as they go up and they would feel it in their it's, low back. It became your pattern. This is what These are what these default patterns, uh, that's how you develop these default patterns as you train them over time. Mm-hmm. And if your default pattern is to be stable with a deadlift with 200 pounds or whatever, uh, you know, lifting a suitcase or a box off the floor, you know, you're, you're, you don't have a default pattern is something you don't have to think about. Yeah. So automatically, and I'm sure you didn't, you realized it after. It's not yeah, like you yeah, thought to yourself. Yeah, it wasn't like I stopped and thought about it. Is I took the first step right away, didn't feel stable, and then poop, my body kicked it back into my hips. It loaded my glutes. Exactly. And then I walked up the rest of the stairs. Exactly. Here's another thing a lot of people uh, are, I, this is funny that people aren't talking about this because this is in, in all the current literature, but one of the body parts that they're noticing the greatest weak weaknesses right now and is in our hands. In fact, there was a, a study done uh, recently, I was like a couple of years ago at college campuses where they were testing young men's grip strength and then they compared they compared it to a test that was done in the early 80s. So essentially, these young men's grip strength compared to the strength of their dad's mm. uh, hands back when they were the same age. Must and it was manual labor. It, it was embarrassing. Yeah. It was like 30, 50 percent weaker. They compared these young men's strength to the to the seventy year old man's strength uh, back in the early eighties. Um, carpal tunnel syndrome is quite common now. You're starting to see a lot of wrist injuries and hand. Our hands are getting very, very weak. And we need we are. I mean, we we are primates, and our hands should be one of the stronger parts of our body. Deadlifts really do a good job of giving you stronger hands. Now, here's the thing. Here's why you think to yourself, why do I need strong hands for? Your hands still today connect you to the rest of your world. Yeah. Anything you do, move, touch, whatever, if you lift it in the real world, it's probably going to be connected to you through your hands. You need to have strong hands. And if you've ever moved out of your apartment or your <laughs> I'm house, just say that. you okay. know exactly what I'm talking about. An hour later, it's yeah. typically your hands that are getting Everything's up. like riding on one finger that's like holding yeah. everything left. So don't, yeah. be, yeah. don't, be that, don't be that guy who has to set his dresser down every 10 yeah. steps. No. <laughs> you, I know, you never want to be that guy, right? Yeah. I tried doing that with my dad. And, yeah. Or the other guy who doesn't want to put it down, but his grip is going, uh, right? And then you drop the no, shit. No, I do it with my dad. And the, the difference between me and my dad is I have strong hands, but they're not tough. Like his uh-huh. hands, he's got the thick skin, you know? Yeah. yeah. So I'm like, how does this so not like turn? Feel it. He yeah. doesn't even feel it. Um, as far as strength is concerned or carryover for sports, it's excellent. It gives you that strong posterior chain 
for some sports, dead, in my opinion, deadlifts are essential. I mean, if you're a grappler, you got to have a good de- – if you want to lift people off the ground and launch them, you need to have a good deadlift. And I remember you know, doing jiu-jitsu and judo, and when my deadlift strength was good – I felt uh, and if I got a hold of somebody, even if my technique wasn't 100%, they were going to get frequent flyer miles because I felt <laughs> yeah. so strong in well, that position. I feel, too, that you're more grounded. So, And I know like every sport varies in terms of like what skills are probably best for, but this being like a fundamental thing to be able to organize your body to all of a sudden brace and, and, and be able to like control the ground that, where you are on the field or, or, or on the court or wherever it is. I mean that's a that's a crucial uh, element in sports. Yeah. Well, no, you're you're bringing a good point with like being grounded because actually a lot of other exercises in sports is on the balls of your feet. Yes. So much of the the emphasis is put on that a majority of the time, and so making sure that you're training where you are completely grounded and driving into the heels uh, plays a big role in working the opposite side. It mm-hmm. does, and again, it just gives you that overall body strength. And I'll say this: like you talk to any. A trainer who's worth their salt. You talk to any athletic coach, and they'll tell you that some of the most important muscles on athletes are revolve around the hips, the lumbopelvic hip area, right? The glutes, the hamstrings, and then the back. Like if those are well developed uh, and strong, you're going to be a better athlete. You're going to be tougher. You see this in football players quite often. Uh, you see this in wrestlers. Uh, you see this in many, many at- baseball players even. Their ability to sprint and take off and stabilize. It's glutes, low back, upper back. Those are all very, very important. More important than some of the other muscles on the body that we tend to glorify. And the deadlift works all of them. So it's one of the best exercises for overall strength. As far as muscle development is concerned, mm-hmm. holy Toledo. I mean, if you want to look good from the back, I cannot – there's no single exercise that can compete uh, to the deadlift. I would literally have to put together – Five, ex- probably four or five exercises, in order to equal the 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 bang for it, you know for the, its dollar uh, to the deadlift, right? Like how many exercises that work all the muscles of the back, the glutes, and the hamstrings as effectively as the deadlift? You have to do like three or four exercises. Well, just not to do that. not only do I agree mm-hmm. with this, this also is an opportunity to address stuff that I see floating around on social media these days, which drives me crazy. Uh, there is this this camp that uh, likes to point out when people talk about uh, deadlifting for the back that it is not a back exercise it's a lower body exercise it's a hip hinge exercise it's not a great exercise for the back uh, and it's always it's always said <laughs> it's by it's always said by people who don't deadlift them. well it's it's always <laughs> exactly. said by somebody who doesn't have an impressive back either show me <laughs> show me somebody who has an, the some of the most impressive backs and then ask the all of them if they believe that they attribute some or if not all of that to their deadlifting. I mean, mm-hmm. it's I for, for me personally, uh, my back went to a whole nother level. Yeah, somewhere on your Instagram, you have that before and after. Yeah, it's deep on my. It's in early, there early on. But it was literally, you know, he was a pro in both pictures. So you're talking about years of training, and then the difference between one picture and the other was months. And yeah. the only difference was you had a dead. And it was so stark and different. It was yeah. crazy. No, no. It completely changed my back. It mm-hmm. looked completely different. I built muscles in my back that it didn't look like I had them before. Uh, and it was purely just from dead. And the irony is that I was do- just like the the hamstring analogy. Um, when I started deadlift, when you start deadlifting as frequent as three times a week, um, it, it obviously ends up replacing a lot of other stuff. I wasn't doing a lot of rowing exercises and machine back exercises anymore. Like I didn't have time to do all that stuff because I was spending it all on improving my deadlift because that's what I was chasing. But the irony was less exercises, more focus just on that, bigger, more developed back from deadlifting. Didn't you notice, uh, I think, was it your cable row that you went Everything. back to? Oh, yeah. Just the similar thing happened with uh, the the leg curls. Like So I talk about how I stopped leg curling. I also like completely eliminated seated row. It just seated row became a... You know, a totally foreign exercise to me, which was a staple. I, I for at least a decade of weight training, uh, anytime I did back seated row was like the first. You know, seated row or pull ups was always my first exercise that I did to start my back workout for the longest time. And then when I got into deadlifting consistently, that completely went out the door. It was just like, okay, I'm not going to see the row. I'm going to get into priming for my back and getting my hips all ready to go heavy deadlift. And deadlifting became like, you know, a 20 minute 
to 30 minute section of my lifting. It was all centered around that. And so I had to drop off some of these exercises that I thought were going to be less beneficial to improving my deadlift. Because again, at that point, the main focus was to get a better deadlift and get strong. The irony and the, the funny part about it was that I ended up building a better looking back by just doing deadlifts than all those other auxiliary movements that I was doing. When you before. went back to the row, mm-hmm. you were stronger. Oh yeah, too, and then I went back to the row, and I had I had added like well over fifty pounds to that's the, so the seat of row while not doing it. You know, that's so crazy. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's that's insane because you that's so opposite of what you would think. Um, and a lot of these guys and girls that are on there saying, "Oh, this doesn't work the back." You know, they're, they're they tend to be these biomechanic experts. And yes, biomechanically speaking. The deadlift is a lumbar pelvic hip exercise. It is a hip exercise. But the tension you place on your back, and especially because it's connecting to your arms, Mm -hmm. and the bracing that is required, and there is some range of motion happening. When you're bent over in a deadlift and you come up to straight, you get lat activation, Mm -hmm. you get rhomboid and trap activation. You Just being retracted, too. I mean, you're contracting your back. And just, okay... Up until this point, okay, years, decade, over a decade of weight training and, and getting strong at pull-ups, strong at row, strong at bent over row. I got really strong at all that. In fact, I think – so up until that point, my lower back and mid-back had never felt more than about 225. So I think at one point I was really strong rowing about 220 mm-hmm. – bent over row 225 and probably seated row with the cables like 175 or 150. Right, right, right. So until – deadlifting became a staple in my life my back had never had never felt 300 400 550 pounds right, before right. so no shit it got strong and it grew because all those other exercises i could never progress to that kind of weight mm-hmm. where deadlifting mm-hmm. allowed me to progress to that much load that much load just isometrically holding with the mm-hmm. back you're gonna build a back yeah. now one thing i want to add you said deadlifting three days a week or two days a week or even four days a week Here's the thing, and this is true for any exercise, but especially a complex gross motor movement like the deadlift, make sure you modify your intensity if you do that. And that's actually how I recommend. If you really want to get good at the deadlift, frequency is very important. I think two days a week of deadlifting for most people is is great. For people who are more advanced, you could do three days a week. But that doesn't mean you're going hard two or three days no. a week. I think hard once a week. So if I'm, if I'm going to deadlift hard, it's once a week. The second day or the third day, it's technique. Yeah, you start tapering it's, off a little bit. Yes, it's form. I'm going much lighter. I'm focusing on how on the feel of the lift, on my technique. One day a week is heavy. I don't think it's a, for most people. You go too hard with you know two or three days a week of deadlifting. I actually just would, like any exercise. I actually would never even go heavy if I was doing three and four. This was like this is all technique. It's all it was never mm. heavy and hard. And if I what I would do though, let's say I I did two or three weeks in a row of like a lot of frequency, like three days a week of deadlifting. But and then now I wanted to see my strength. Then I would plan. Okay, next week I'm gonna see like what my max is or mm-hmm. what I'm up to. And then I would drop down to only two times of deadlifting that week. Right, and it would right. be a real hard heavy one, and then it would be like a real light one, and just kind of like going form and technique or speed, something like that. Right, mm-hmm. right. Now, de- if you want to get a stronger deadlift, for those of you who are listening who are more advanced, uh, one exercise that's got tremendous carryover to the deadlift is the squat. You get stronger at squatting. Your deadlift tends to go up. Here's the second thing. One of the beauties of the deadlift, there's two things that I love about it. Number one, you don't need a spotter. Uh, The floor is right there, so it's very easy to put it down. Um, Number two, it's an easy exercise to use progressive resistance on. And deadlifts work so well with progressive resistance. I love progressive. I can't even say it. (laughs) (laughs) Progressive resistance. You get so excited. Say it really fast. Yeah, Yeah. Uh, yeah, with uh, rubber bands or chains or things like that to use uh, on the outside, it it just gives you that nice, it matches your strength curve. Like it's just a a nice way to uh, introduce, uh, you know, an an even higher amount of resistance against you. Oh, it's for progressive resistance, it goes deadlift first, then squat, and then bench press in terms of the best exercise to do those with. And this is literally how it works. You get a heavy chain, you attach it to the sides of the bar, and as you lift, each link starts to come off the floor, so the weight starts to get heavier. It just gradually gets heavier. That's it. And incidentally, you're strongest at the top of the deadlift and weakest at the bottom, so it matches your strength curve. Resistance bands 
uh, do this as well. And when I added those is when I got my deadlift over the, the, the 600 pound mark. That's when I hit my highest deadlift of all time was, was I was practicing a lot with progressive uh, resistance. The other thing you do with bands is you can attach them at angles. So if you focus, if you want to focus on the pullback or the lockout or different, you can change the angle so that the, the bands are maybe pulling the bar away from you to make you focus on staying back on your heels and pulling back. So deadlifts, phenomenal exercise. Every single person should do them, get really good at them, practice them, and then get strong at them to develop the best hamstrings, glutes, and back that you'll get uh, in your entire life. Get your life. back bulletproof. That's it. Look, Mind Pump is recorded on video as well as audio, so you can come find us on YouTube, Mind Pump Podcast. You can also find all of us on social media. You can find us on Instagram and now also on Parlor. You can find Justin at Mind Pump Justin. Me at Mind Pump Sal, Adam at Mind Pump Adam, and Doug at Mind Pump Doug. Oh, yeah, yeah, I, yeah, it is. <laughs> no, did you see that Justin did an old throwback post of him and I? when? Dude, uh, you guys were I know. handsome. I, I had to pick one where Adam was at his handsomest, you know, <laughs> that, that way he wouldn't get all mad at so me. So this is a, this is, this nobody, is, every, all the comments, nobody. This isn't Adam. Yeah, yeah, no. like, so I didn't even like respond. So like, here's yeah. what, here's what's happened. And